I don't like repairing fences. So I built one that will outlive me. It cost me less than the average wooden privacy fence, and by weight, it's actually mostly made of recycled materials. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to build a fence that could last 100 years. About five years ago, I made the decision to build a pipe fence around my entire property, both front yard and back. I did this because I planted a literal forest of edible plants and my neighborhood is overrun with deer that like to eat those plants. It's so bad that in a single night, I've seen them kill everything that I had just spent the entire day prior planting. So I concluded it was well worth a few bucks to keep out the bucks and the does and the fawns. This is the last remaining section of fence to build and it connects to my neighbor's yard. So even though it won't be keeping any deer out, it's the perfect way of sharing with you how to build a pipe fence for yourself. And yes, right now you can see right through it, but if you stick around till the end of this video, I'll show you how to get instant privacy. In my part of Texas, drill stem pipe is readily available at most recycling centers. It has nice thick walls and holds up very well over time, especially in my dry climate. This was the pipe I used to make the fence. There are different sizes, but I used 2 and 3 8 inch. After I tore down the fence on each property line, I made sure that the land was graded in a way that would pull the runoff water toward my side of the new fence. My neighbors were happy to be rid of any puddles, and I was happy to collect the water in my yard. And here you can see a pit that I dug years ago. This thing probably holds somewhere around 100 to 200 gallons. And this is probably the only reason that this sycamore survived when I put the poor thing through all of the trauma of cutting out a lot of its root structure when I installed my 30,000 gallon rain tank, which you can see here. With the old fence out of the way, the first step of building a straight fence is to hang a string line. Once the string line was in place, it was time to measure and mark where each post was going into the ground. Because I bought pipe that was pre-cut to 10 foot lengths, I knew I wanted a post about every 10 feet. This would help minimize the number of cuts when it came time to weld the horizontal pipes in place. With each post hole marked, it was time to dig some holes. For a six foot tall fence, the goal was to dig at least two feet deep. In my region, the soil is full of limestone boulders. Sometimes they are as big as beach balls. If you encounter one of these boulders with an auger bit, it sends the bit careening off at an angle. So while I tried my best to use the power of diesel whenever I could, I sometimes had to resort to a sharpshooter shovel and a jackhammer. Eventually I was able to get all my holes dug. On occasion, the boulders forced me slightly off perfect 10 foot centers, but I'll show you how I compensated for that later. Next, it was time to cut what's called a saddle joint into the top of each fence post. I started by standing a 10 foot pipe upright in each hole since the holes were all slightly different depths. Then I measured six feet up from the ground and subtracted one and three quarters inch. Looking at this older fence section, you can see why. See how the fence winds up being taller once you've welded the horizontal pipe on top of the post? Since I wanted the final height right at six feet, I had to subtract the difference. Then I brought each pipe over to my metal miter saw. First I cut the pipe to an appropriate length. Then to make the saddle joint, I set the saw to 35 degrees and I marked the pipe with three lines to divide it into four equal sections. If you cut the outside sections off and then rotate the pipe 180 degrees to cut off the exact opposite side, that leads to a nice uniform saddle joint. This also works with an angle grinder or a bandsaw, but I like the miter saw because it doesn't make a lot of dust and it doesn't require cutting oil. When the saddle joint was done, I put each pipe into its respective hole and verified that the height was correct using a small scrap of pipe. Once all the pipes were cut, it was time to hold them in place and pour concrete. I used short sections of 2x4 boards and some rebar spikes to brace each post in place. A spade bit can be used to drill a hole into the narrow face of each 2x4. Then I position the 2x4s 90 degrees apart from each other and pound the rebar spikes through them. And last, I used some rubber footed wood clamps and a fence post level to position and clamp the pipes in place so that it's as level as possible. All the while, it's important to remember that the pipes need to be positioned so that the string line just barely touches the same side of each pipe. You also need to make sure that the saddle joints point the correct direction and line up with each other. Then I used my favorite mixer to get the concrete ready. 
I transferred each batch into a mixing tray and tossed the concrete into each hole. Stabbing the wet concrete a few times with a rebar spike helps to ensure that all the large air pockets are removed. There are those that stress the importance of cleaning your mixer with soap to prevent things like this from getting stuck in there. But I don't subscribe to such beliefs. Do you? Do you subscribe to silly things? Do it. Once the concrete had been given adequate time to set up, I removed the rebar spikes and 2x4s. So now that all my posts have saddle joints and the cement is firmed up enough to actually hold some weight, it's time to start putting the horizontal member on top of each of these posts. I'm going to start on this one on the corner because this one does not have a saddle joint. I'm going to weld it a little bit differently here and I'll show you that. I'm using some jack stands that I got from Harbor Freight to help hold the pipe up and be able to adjust it to exactly the right height. That way when I weld the joint, I like how it looks as far as everything being flush with each other. So now, one by one, I just have to lift each post in place. I did my best to center these posts every 10 feet exactly because these pipes are 10 feet long. It was imperfect, so on some of these posts they're not quite at 10 feet. That means that they're either going to be too far apart and the pipe's going to fall down through them, or they'll be too close together and I'm wasting space. So you'll see as I go how I compensate for those little errors. So you can see here how the saddle joint works. The horizontal pipe just sits in that cut and you can barely even see light around it. It's a pretty nice and tight fit. And the other pipe just sits right next to it. Over here, the joinery is gonna be a little bit different, but I'm gonna use some of the previous scraps that I created by cutting the pipes. I'm gonna kinda of splice that in here to close the gap, mostly just to keep bugs and water from getting in there. I'm just gonna tack things in place for now because I'm not wearing a respirator or any leather sleeves or even shoes that don't get burned through from the sparks. So I'll gear up and that's when I'll really do all the solid welds. For the sections where the pipes didn't quite align perfectly, I cut scraps to length and spliced them into the gaps. I used some magnet clamps to help hold the pipes together while I welded them. Once all the pipes had been tack welded into place, I found myself with another excuse to use my laser cleaner from the previous video I made. Check that out after this one. Once all the joints were nice and laser clean, I went to town welding things up solid. So most of this fence is now welded up, for better or for worse. There's some flaws and imperfections, but I think overall it came out pretty nicely. I'm pretty happy with how the welds turned out. So now really it's time to turn my attention to the gate system over here. So I think I'm going to take some inspiration from Texas ranches that I've seen. A lot of times if you look at the entryway to a ranch, now this big arch going up and over the main gate, that's to keep each post connected to each other so that they don't tilt over independently, which would then lead to the gate tipping and tilting so you can't latch it and the hinges get weird. So I'm going to do something similar to that. All right, so now the framing for the gate system is done. It's nice and sturdy. The concrete's only about 24 hours old, so I won't do a muscle up because I don't want to break it. Just kidding, I don't want to break myself. I can't do a muscle up. Anyway, we're gonna start building gates. Gate number one is going here, this is for me. Gate number two is going over here, this is for my neighbor. And gate number three is going right on the fence line so that my neighbor and I can pass through easily because we're friends. All right, we're gonna start building gates now. <laughs> Bill Gates. You know, Microsoft. I used 2.5 inch square tube for the gates themselves. 
I chose this material because it has a similar diameter to the pipe I used, so it looks nice and uniform when you weld them next to each other. I like to use these weld on barrel hinges with grease fittings for my gates. Then for the latch, I just use a standard gravity latch from the local home improvement store. I welded what's called horse panel to each of the gates and the section in between them. With the gates all done and good, it was time to turn the pipe skeleton into an actual functional fence by adding a barrier material. And to do this, I'm using welded utility fabric. And this stuff doesn't seem really fabric-y to me, but what it lacks in an intuitive name, it makes up for in longevity. It's made of steel, and at every point where the wires cross, it's welded together, so it's very strong. I hold this stuff against the pipes, using safety wire pliers and stainless steel wire. Let me show you how that works. To make the welded wire fabric easier to handle, I pass a piece of flat stock through the roll to act both as a handle and as a device to prevent the whole thing from unrolling suddenly. To unroll it in a controlled manner, I pass the steel handle back and forth to let out half a turn at a time. Then I use a piece of paracord and the magnet clamps to keep the roll upright while I wire tie the material to the pipes. This beautiful little time-saving tool is called a safety wire pliers. It has a spiraling pull handle that spins the pliers around and twists wire tight. This is standard stainless steel wire I picked up at Harbor Freight. Once you've wrapped the wire around the pipe fence material, you can trim the excess using the clippers on the same tool. The process of fastening the welded wire fabric into place is very much a wash, rinse, repeat sort of thing. Eventually I made my way all the way down to the end of the fence and simply clipped off the excess wire fabric using some clippers I have. So while I finally have a fully functional fence, I feel my family friend from afar would fervently prefer framing with far less refuse. Therefore, flashing. I got this flashing off Amazon. It's six inches wide, made of pure aluminum. The gaps in here are roughly four inches wide, so I'm going to cut this right in half to be a three inch strip, and I'm going to weave it in and out of the welded wire so that it obscures the view, so that my wonderful neighbors don't have to stare at my piles of materials for the rest of their lives. Long term, I plan on growing vines up this fence, but that'll take two or three years. So in the meantime, I want them to at least not hate the view. And I'm sure as many of the comments in my previous videos have said, they probably wouldn't like the view of my yard. To weave the flashing into the fence, one of the first things I did was rig up a flashing dispenser using an old 5 gallon bucket. I simply cut a slit into the bottom that would allow the flashing to roll out in a controlled fashion. Then I made sure to orient the roll so that it was pointing with the free end of the flashing the direction I needed to pull it. I used some hooks to hang the bucket at the correct height. Then I performed something that looks like SpaceX basket weaving on 85 feet.
and ta-da, I like it. If you like it, share this video with someone you know that needs a new fence. If you don't like it, click the thumbs up button. Yeah, let's see if that works. So in the long run, the plan is to grow vines all over this fence. It's just that in the meantime, the aluminum flashing provides relative privacy. It also has the added benefit that it has a really cool reflective effect. It's hard to capture in video, but at sunset, the whole thing kind of glows the color of the sky. It's actually really pretty. And I know at least one person out there is going to say, Now, a deer jump clear over a six-foot fence. You might be right, but in the suburban area I live in, it's been over 10 years that I've lived in this house with a six-foot fence. Not once has a deer jumped inside the yard. I think it's probably because I have all this man-made junk and crazy bushes and they're kind of scared of where they might land. So yeah, if you live out in the sticks and you have a pet springbok, you should probably build your fence taller. But in suburbia, you'll probably be okay. If you're in the 2% of people still watching this video, I'd appreciate it if you take the time to go down below and click all the things. If you're a really obsessed fan and you want some merch, the that guy hat, the deer mug shot shirt, there's a link to my store down below. In my upcoming videos, I plan on starting the greenhouse. It's going to be sub-irrigated and self-heating, so stay tuned for that. We'll see you on the next one.